actually get that going. So um, we, Mental Health Awareness of Michiana is a nonprofit in Northern Indiana that is an affiliate of Mental Health America. And we are focused on promoting mental health education, collaboration between providers and improving access to mental health care. Um, Today, we have a webinar on um, eating disorders and racial disparities. We are delighted to welcome uh, Dr. Erica Disrasa and Rebecca Ayer from Project HEAL. And they're going to uh, um, educate us and lead us in discussion. The title of their talk is, If Eating Disorders Don't Discriminate, Why is the Recovery Community So Homogenous? So I will turn over uh, the uh, controls to Rebecca in a moment. Um, I will just give you a little bit of logistics. Uh, we are recording today's session, so we will upload that to our MHAM YouTube channel probably sometime over the weekend. If you want to um, come back and view it, we're happy to have you uh, do that. And uh, we will distribute the PowerPoint presentation for today, a reading list uh, for additional, any additional reading you may want to do as well as the certificate of attendance. Um, we also have an evaluation that I will send you the link after the presentation. Please um, give us feedback. We, we wanna hear from you about, um, about today's event and then any other suggestions you have for future events. So on that note, um, Rebecca, I'm gonna turn it over to you um, as I launch our, uh, our pre webinar poll uh, just to kind of get us going and ask some questions on what people understand about eating disorders. So with that, um, Rebecca, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you so much. Welcome everyone, thank you for tuning in. Um, I, it's such a privilege to be able to give this talk um, on behalf of Project HEAL, um, but also with my colleague, Erica. Um, so my name is Rebecca Ayer. I'm the CEO of Project HEAL. Um, Project HEAL is a national eating disorder nonprofit that's focused on equitable healthcare access. So our mission is to break down systemic financial and healthcare barriers to eating disorder treatment. And we're going to get into why that's really important throughout this um, and really and close with a more thorough description of what Project HEAL does. Uh, but when Mental Health Awareness of Michiana reached out to me uh, to see if Project Heal would do a talk about this, immediately I knew that I needed to, uh, to loop in my amazing board director, uh, Dr. Jarasa. Um, so I'm going to read uh, an intro so that you guys can have a little bit more awareness of who she is. Before I do that, uh, just to tell you a little bit about me, I'm a licensed therapist by trade, been treating eating disorders since 2011, um, have been with Project Heal since early 2019 and became the CEO in April of 2020, which was a wild time to become the CEO of anything. Um, but it's been really remarkable um, and I'm incredibly proud and passionate about um, equitable eating disorder treatment access. Um, so without further ado, uh, Dr. Erica Jarasa is a double board certified child, adolescent, and adult psychiatrist who has been committed to serving individuals and families impacted by eating disorders for over 10 years. She's passionate about education, increasing mental health awareness, breaking down barriers of stigma, and addressing and eliminating health disparities that impact individuals from diverse ethnic backgrounds. As a mental health advocate, Dr. Drasa currently serves on the Race, Ethnicity, and Equity Committee for the North Carolina Psychiatric Association and she's a delegate for the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry Assembly. Dr. Jarasa earned her BS at Spelman College, Master of Public Health and Healthcare and Leadership at UNC Chapel Hill and her MD at Duke University um, School of Medicine. She completed her adult psych psychiatry residency and her child and adolescent psychiatry fellowship at Duke University. She's the co-founder and partner of Catalyst Therapeutic Services LLC based in Durham, North Carolina. So you can see why I was very excited to invite Dr. Drasa to be on Project Heal's Board of Directors. And thank you so much, Erica, for doing this with me. So um, hopefully everyone has heard the phrase, you know, eating disorders don't discriminate, uh, but we're gonna get into what, what that really means um, and, and why that really hasn't shown up in the eating disorder treatment community yet, um, especially with regard to race disparities. So. I'm gonna start um, 
with a little exercise. So if you could just bring to mind a picture of someone with an eating disorder, just immediate biases, right? Um, I think everyone is informed by the images that we see in the media and by just our, our implicit bias and the exposures that we have. So if it's a limited view of that, there's no shame in that. There's a reason for it. We're gonna get into that. So just take a second and think of that. My guess is that many immediately thought of an anorexic young white woman. And the reason for that uh, is manifold, but one of them is that this uh, is the first few pages of a Google search of eating disorder, a person with an eating disorder. Uh, honestly, for pages and pages in, in Google's image search, uh, there are not pictures of people in different sized bodies. Um, and there are not pictures of people that have different racial identities or gender identities. Um, so the reason maybe that we have those biases is because those are the images that are perpetuated. So the, the myth, the stereotype uh, exists, right? Eating disorders are a rich young white girl problem. Um, I, I, I wish that I could see all of your faces and sort of get a raise of hands of who, who, has, who had that bias at any time in their life or maybe even still has that bias. It's certainly what I had when I was growing up. Um, you know, if I saw someone who was incredibly underweight and, and a young white woman, I would immediately go, oh my gosh, how sad she has an eating disorder, right? It's just this automatic bias. And of course, as I learned more and became a clinician and got a lot more exposure and education, learned that that turns out not to be true at all. Um, and that's a problem. So one of the reasons for this, I think, is that the media has really only told one story. Um, so I did also a Google search of like eating disorder films, um, eating disorder celebrities, and we have not that many stories being told about eating disorders, right? There are millions of movies about um, drug and alcohol abuse, um, lots of other depictions of mental illness or um, different medical issues in, in media and eating disorders just plain don't show up. Um, a lot of people try and it gets really uncomfortable. I should have included the crown on here because that's the most recent edition, right? So Princess Di is one of the most famous people ever to be public with having an eating disorder. Um, and, and then you have just a handful of films that have depicted it. And in every instance, right, they're white, thin people, um, whether they're young or whether they're affluent, right, it still guides us to this assumption that this is not a widespread epidemic um, affecting people of every race, ethnicity, size, gender, age. So. Um, there's a reason for our bias and our stereotypes, and it's definitely perpetuated by the things, the information that we have access to. The consequence of that, right, is that there's also, uh, there, there, we're gonna get into this too, like there's a ripple effect of what this stereotype does. So this is the results of a Google search of eating disorder treatment team. And uh, Erica and I have talked about this a lot where, you know, if you go to an eating disorder conference or if you've worked at a treatment center, which both of, both she and I have, the vast majority of the staff ref reflects that stereotype. Not necessarily that they have an eating disorder, but that there's just a dramatic, uh, overwhelming white presence. Um, there's sort of like a sea of, of white women generally at eating disorder conferences. Um, the higher you get in leadership, there's a more gender diversity um, in terms of male representation, which is another issue we're not going to get in here into today. Um, but right, these are entire staffs of eating disorder treatment centers and eating disorder um, departments. And so the fact that that stereotype exists filters out and it's sort of a, I, I believe, a uh, like a self-perpetuating problem where if we only think one type of person is affected by eating disorders, then those are the kinds of people who will get treatment. And then those are the kinds of people who recover. And those are the kinds of people who go into this work. And then when they're the ones represented in the treatment, they're the, they invite people who look like them and have that shared experience to come to their care and to receive um, culturally appropriate care. So, um, Erica, I'll pass it to you. So 
Um, well, thank you so much for inviting me and for allowing me to be a part of this. And thanks to all of you who are participating today to just learn a little bit more about um, how there are challenges in eating disorders and, acknowledge and um, acknowledging eating disorders in different populations. So the fact that you're here today to learn, I'm just really honored. Um, so we're gonna show you a little video and um, this is called the nine truths about eating disorders. So um, take a look. Truth number one, many people with eating disorders look healthy, yet may be extremely ill. Truth number two, families are not to blame and can be the patients and providers best allies in treatment. Truth number three, an eating disorder diagnosis is a health crisis that affects personal and family functioning. Truth number four, eating disorders are not choices, but serious biologically influenced illnesses. Truth number five, Eating disorders affect people of all genders, ages, races, ethnicities, body shapes, weights, sexual orientation, and socioeconomic status. Truth number six, eating disorders carry an increased risk of both suicide and medical complications. Truth number seven, genes and environment play an important role in the development of eating disorders. Truth number eight, genes alone do not predict who will develop eating disorders. Truth number nine, Full recovery from an eating disorder is possible. Early detection and intervention are important. Great, thank you so much, Rebecca. So that was a little video from the cast of To the Bone, and I don't know if you all have seen that, um, but I, I thought they did a really good job of showing different kinds of eating disorders, and they actually included some diversity. That was the first time I've seen that in a media <laughs> setting, um, so it was refre refreshing to see. Um, but to go back to Rebecca's original point, I have to say I had to check my own biases during my training. You know, as I um, did my medical school training and residency, I had an idea of what eating disorders were. And I generally came to the conclusion that it was anorexia nervosa and that these were eating disorders that impacted mainly white women, white young adolescents from affluent backgrounds. And I learned a lot. I had to check my own bias and realize that yes, just like the video said, eating disorders affect people of all genders, all ages, all races, all ethnicities, all body shapes and weights, sexual orientations, and socioeconomic status. Just because we don't necessarily see that portrayed in the media doesn't mean it doesn't exist. And um, it's been a great journey for me to see just how it can impact all of these different populations. Um, and, that, and to also learn that there are more eating disorders than anorexia nervosa, which is important for us to know and understand about that because it can be very devastating. Um, but I think it's important to know that there are several different types of eating disorders. And anorexia nervosa, I'm gonna just go through a couple of them um, according to the DSM-5, just to make sure we're all on the same page in terms of what eating disorders actually comprise. And anorexia nervosa can come in two forms, a restrictive type and a binge purge type. Generally, individuals with anorexia nervosa are unable to consume adequate nutrition. They're not able to get a, enough caloric intake. And that's because they're restricting due to um, distorted images about their body type. So there's a disturbance in body perception, whereas what they see is just doesn't match up to reality. And as such, they have an intense fear of eating or gaining weight, which can lead to restriction. There are some individuals who may restrict solely, but there are others who may have binge purge type, where there's a cycle of restriction and binging and purging. And you may ask, okay, well, how is that different from bulimia nervosa? Well, bulimia nervosa is generally characterized by binge eating, and binges are um, known as episodes of time where we eat excessive amounts of food in a short period of time. And that is actually associated with a loss of control as well. So again, large amounts of food, large quantities of food in a short period of time, but there is a lack of control. There generally isn't um, a cycle of restriction, although there can be, but not to the extent of anorexia nervosa. 
In addition, bulimia nervosa can be, um, usually uh, by definition, there has to be some sort of compensatory behavior. So if one participates in a binge episode, they may feel um, feelings of shame, of guilt, um, of isolation, despair, or, or even hopelessness. And as such, they compensate um, by engaging in behaviors such as self-induced vomiting or other things like um, increased diuretic use or um, laxative use or abuse, or they may engage in compensatory behaviors like excessive exercise. So that's the main difference between anorexia nervosa and bulimia nervosa. Now, I actually did not realize again until I started my training that there were several other eating disorders besides just those two. So we also have what's known as binge eating disorder, which is relatively new in terms of um, diagnostic criteria. So we use the DSM-5, and I believe a lot of you are clinicians, so you know this, um, DSM-5 is our Bible for diagnosing any mm -hmm. kind of condition and binge eating disorder was included in the DSM-5 update. However, we've seen these behaviors for many, many years. It's just we didn't have a formal diagnosis for it. Um, binge eating disorder is actually um, very similar to bulimia nervosa with the exception that there's no compensatory behavior. So the individual may engage in binging behaviors, but they're not making up for it by engaging in self-induced vomiting or abusing laxatives or diuretics or compensatory exercise. Um, however, they may still have a lot of negative emotions related to the binging, depression, sadness, shame, guilt, hopelessness, and sometimes even suicidality. The other thing that's interesting about binge eating disorder is that it actually is the most common eating disorder out of all of the eating disorders. So again, when we think about the research that's been done and all the attention that goes to anorexia nervosa, and understandably so, um, the reality is that eating disorder is much more common in our popula in all populations, um, more common than anorexia and bulimia put together. Mm -hmm. And actually, when we think about you know, breast cancer awareness, HIV, and we think about all of the attention and research dollars that goes to those disorders, binge eating disorder is actually far more common than breast cancer, far more common than HIV. So that just puts it in perspective. Mm -hmm. um, a couple of others that I think are worth noting are avoidant and restrictive food intake disorder, also known as ARFID. This is extremely picky eating where individuals may not necessarily get their nutritional um, needs met because they're restricting due to um, avoiding foods that are fear inducing. So perhaps they um, ate a food in the past and they were really afraid of it. And as such, they just stopped eating all foods associated with that. Um, or they are restricting for other reasons. Maybe they just not, they don't have interest in food. Um, or again, they have severe picky eating where they're only feeling comfortable eating certain types or textures of food. And because of that, they're not getting all of their nutritional needs met. Um, we see this at very young ages and it can be associated with other common co-occurring psychiatric disorders such as anxiety disorders and OCD. And then we have um, just a couple of others that don't necessarily always fit the box. So other specified feeding or eating disorder. This um, examples of this can be purging disorder where there's no binging, but people just engage in purging behaviors, or maybe they have atypical features of anorexia nervosa or bulimia nervosa, or perhaps they just have, um, they don't quite meet the full criteria. So maybe they have binges, you know, three binges in a week and they can go for two weeks without binging and then they have excessive binges. So maybe they don't necessarily meet the full criteria, but it still causes impairment in their everyday life. And then of course, unspecified specified feeding or eating disorder, also known as UFED. And I have no idea who came up with all these names, OSFED and UFED. It's <laughs> using at times. Um, but again, these are symptoms of feeding or eating disorder traits that again, don't meet full criteria for diagnosis, but they still can be impairing for that individual. There are other types of eating disorders that I won't necessarily get into, such as pica, for instance, um, which or rumination disorder. Um, but those are also eating disorders included under the DSM-5 umbrella of eating disorders. So as you can see, Eating disorders can affect 
people in many different ways. It's not just restriction. Um, and as such, that also means that it doesn't uh, apply to certain types of body types. And I think that's something that I had to check myself about because again, I had this picture of a very thin white woman or a white teenage girl where the reality is they come in all different shapes and sizes and people can appear to be healthy, but still really struggle with an eating disorder. It's really important to frame all of this within a multicultural tech um, context. And the, the reason for that is because again, eating disorders show up very differently when it comes to gender or when it comes to age even. Um, how a eating disorder can appear in a five-year-old. And yes, I said five. Um, <laughs> I have seen kids as young as five and six struggle with an eating disorder that can look very different than someone who is in menopause. Um, and then also looking at sex and um, gender huge impact in terms of eating disorders and the expression of eating disorders. And of course, what we're going to talk about today is race and ethnicity and how that shows up in the eating disorder world. And we just have to make sure that we're educating ourselves. And that's why I'm so glad that you all are here today, because I think this will really help you all in identifying individuals who we may not necessarily um, typically diagnose with having eating disorders, but it just increases our awareness as clinicians. So in terms of um, evidence for the con contribution of Western ideals, I think that it's important for us to recognize that um, the Westernization of body image and body type and beauty and standards of beauty really can happen through TV, social media. And it's interesting because again, we tend to think of eating disorders within a context of the United States, but actually these ideals um, can, can actually impact people in other cultures all throughout the world. And there have been research studies looking at different populations such such as populations in Fiji or Nicaragua, um, or even other countries in Africa like Nigeria or Ghana, where individuals are being introduced to different TV shows from the US or social media and seeing these standards of beauty and then internalizing those standards of beauty and internalizing this ideal of um, thinness that, um, you know, that we see here in the United States. And that has been associated with increased rates of disordered eating behaviors and eating disorders in those populations. So I think it's really important for us to think about the cultural context, not only here in the United States, but also worldwide. So one of the questions that we asked at the beginning of this, I believe was, you know, uh, eating disorders affect people of all races, sizes, genders, um, ages, uh, equally. And so it's a little bit of a trick question. Uh, the answer was false. Uh, what is true is that eating disorders don't discriminate, um, and which is sort of what we named the, the presentation for that reason. Um, but they actually show up differently um, across cultures. And some of this has to do with a more global perspective, which Erica had prepared and we didn't have time to cover. But if you actually go into um, different cultures um, across the globe and look at the relationship with food and body, they have really genuinely different numbers, right, than the U.S. And, and the more American culture permeates and globalization occurs and social media and television, and all of those things take over, the more those numbers start to match up. But there really are different relationships with food and body across cultures. And then those, those differences remain in the US um, because people continue to exist within their cultures because of their families and their, and their subcommunities. So one of the interesting things to know is that actually uh, bulimia nervosa is more common in Latinx communities uh, than in their non-Latinx white community, white counterparts. Um, and binge eating disorder, it occurs at similar rates in Latinx and in white cultures, but the prevalence of any binge eating, so it would fall more into some of those latter categories of like, maybe it's not as frequent as a diagnosis or it's not occurring um, as, as, as frequently, or what was the other word? I don't remember, but basically like maybe the actual um, pattern isn't meeting the official DSM criteria, but binge eating is occurring. 
happens more commonly in Latinx cultures than in white um, non-Latinx cultures. And so we don't know yet, I think, exactly why that is. And that's why I think more research is necessary and why it's important to have presentations like this that highlight some of the, the racial disparities. But we do know that those diagnoses actually occur more often in Latinx populations. And you know, it's really important not to treat any culture as a monolith, right? And what is Latinx culture? That's, you know, so many countries and, and it's an entire, uh, it's multiple regions of the of the globe. Um, and so I think some of the reasons for that may vary depending on the country of origin or the family structure, um, but the statistics are there and it's, it's statistically significant. So it's worth noting that. at Black American populations and African American populations, of course, there's a lot of diversity, right, in terms of populations as well. When we think about Blacks who have been in the United States and whose ancestors go back to slave the slave trade, right, and those who are brought to the United States. But then we are also thinking about African Americans who are, you know, maybe first generation coming from other African cultures, countries, or, um, Caribbean countries as well coming to the United States. So I think there's a lot of diversity in terms of black culture as well. Um, but one thing that we know based on the limited research and I will say limited research there, we, we need a lot more research and we'll get into that a little bit later. Um, but the prevalence for both bulimia nervosa and binge eating is actually significantly higher among African-American and black American populations when we're, we're comparing them to their white counterparts. This is particularly particularly true in teenagers where some studies show that they are 50% more likely to engage in binging and purging behaviors than whites. Now it's interesting because there has been data, I will say back in the day, um, research from the 90s and early 2000s showing that Blacks report actually less body dissatisfaction and eating concerns than white women. So there may be a discrepancy. It's like, okay, how does that make sense if they are finding that they're, um, you know, more confident or they don't necessarily put as much value in thinness um, as their white counterparts, then help me understand why there may be increased binging and purging behaviors. And I really think that's because we have limited research and a limited understanding. I do think, you know, there have been a couple of surveys, a few looking at college age students, over a thousand college age students, um, showing that they, you know, don't necessarily compare themselves to the media images that we're bombarded with constantly that show this idea of thinness. However, they also said that that's associated with a stronger racial identity. And I think that's really important to um, acknowledge not only for black individuals, but also other cultures that if you have a strong racial identity, um, then that may be associated with lower body image dissatisfaction. But one thing that we have to keep in mind, and we can go to the next slide, mm -hmm is the impact of acculturation. This goes into acculturation in the immigrant experience, but I also think acculturation even in the Black experience. Mm -hmm. um, because when we think about um, acculturating to Westernization ideas and acculturating to white ideas of beauty and standards of beauty, I think that can happen for individuals who aren't necessarily immigrants either. And I think that's why we may see a discrepancy that the more likely an individual um, has to acculturate or assimilate to the culture and adopt the main beliefs and attitudes and behaviors um, that they see within the culture they're assimilating to, that that may be associated with higher rates of dissatisfaction with their bodies and internalization of this need to be thin, of this drive to be thin, or again, the white standard of beauty. Um, and what we know is that there's some research showing that children of immigrants, especially first generation, second generation, definitely can be at a higher risk of body dissatisfaction and also engaging in dieting and restrictive behaviors. And I would say that's also true for some Black populations. Again, even if they're not necessarily immigrants, I can think of a lot of patients that I've worked with who, you know, grew up in a certain environment, but then they had to start going to a private school. 
and they find themselves in a private school being one of the only black girls. And I can tell you, I've been there, um, you know, finding yourself in a school where you, no one else really looks like you, your body doesn't look like everyone else. And then you start to internalize this idea that, okay, maybe I need to change my body so I can assimilate to whatever that standard of beauty and of course, that can lead to the development of eating disorders. Um, so again, it's, you know, what is a culture of stress? It's adapting the beliefs, the um, attitudes and behaviors of that dominant culture. And that can not only impact beauty ideals, but that may impact gender roles, um, even food availability. I know families where um, the child or the teenager was having a hard time assimilating and they just stopped eating their family's food because they didn't want to be associated with that. I remember having a patient tell me that she just stopped eating um, what her family would prepare because she would go to school and people would make fun of her for eating foods that look totally different from them. So she wanted to eat more food well, that wasn't available in her home. So next thing you know, it leads to restriction. So it's, it's so interesting how eating disorders can develop even within a cultural context. Um, so those are things that we have to ask our patients about and ask our clients about um, to understand what cultural traditions exist in terms of food. You know, for some cultures, their food may be celebratory. Um, you know, there's a lot of meaning and value assigned to food um, or, to restricting to fasting, you know, there may be some cultures and some religions where they may fast and that's a normative behavior. So we have to look to see, okay, how much um, are we evaluating based on what's normal for that individual's culture versus what goes into um, or develops into disordered be eating behaviors. Yeah, and I think about, you know, what we just learned about even just the, the highest level snippet of the way that eating disorders show up differently in different cultures. And I think about um, some of the statistics that we understand about eating disorders, who has them, who's getting treatment and how many, who's recovering and who's entering into the field, right? And I think that it's really important to think about barriers to access. Uh, systemic barriers exist. One of them has to do with what we've just really covered, which is, uh, and we'll continue to, to cover, is this idea that if you have a singular idea of who has an eating disorder, you're going to have underdiagnosis, late diagnosis, misdiagnosis, um, and that's going to create these systemic barriers that have a ripple effect. And there are a lot of other barriers that people experience. So um, we'll I think I talk about this later, but it's worth saying a couple of times. Uh, there are 30 million people who have been diagnosed with eating disorders in the US. Um, and, and it's really important to say that those are the people who are on record having been diagnosed. And given what we've just learned about how um, kind of inequitable diagnosis and, and um, detection is, I think that we can safely say that that number is higher. I know at least 10 people off the top of my head who have had eating disorders and have, who have never been formally diagnosed or treated for them. Um, and so when you think about how many people probably have eating disorders and even of the 30 million eating disorders in the US that we know of, only 20% of those people are getting treatment. Uh, and why, <laughs> that is a really low number. Um, it's a scary number, especially when you consider that eating disorders are the second most fatal mental illness, uh, second to opioid use disorder. So, and everyone understands the opioid crisis and the threat that that poses, and yet eating disorders are remaining sort of um, under discussed and under understood. The reason that a lot of folks aren't getting treatment um, includes inadequate insurance coverage, which is a, a huge, uh, huge issue in the U.S. Um, a lot of it having to do with the difference between private insurance and government funded insurance, um, all of the different levels of care that exist for eating disorders, right? There's inpatient, which is hospitalization and requires medical instability. There's residential, which is 24 hour care, but not necessarily a hospital based treatment, still does require medical instability to get authorization, which I think is a problem. There's partial hospitalization, which is sort of like day treatment. You know, you're somewhere all day and then you go home at night. So fairly, pretty much residential without overnight stay. Um, intensive outpatient, which is a few days a week, groups and individual appointments and meal support. And then outpatient care, which is your standard, um, you know, therapist, dietitian, psychiatrist appointments. 
Medicare and Medicaid only cover inpatient, that hospitalization and outpatient, occasionally partial hospitalization if it's at an actual hospital. Otherwise, the treatment isn't covered and most people need a, a continuity of care and most providers and most research suggests that a continuity of care is really important to recovery. Instead, we have I mean, millions of people with uh, government funded insurance who are bouncing back and forth between outpatient care and hospitalization. And that's only the people who are medically compromised enough to require hospitalization. We just saw how many people have binge eating disorder or bulimia who may never reach a point of medical instability, but they may be psychiatrically compromised very profoundly and not be able to go into any of the treatment that's available to people who have private insurance that will cover it. Even private insurance doesn't cover the length of stay that is often required, cutting people off prematurely despite clinical um, recommendations. And, you know, I have experienced as a clinician that decision of premature cutoff by insurance costing the life of people who, who are um, cut off from care. So that's just insurance coverage, uh, limited financial resources. Treatment is very expensive. Um, residential inpatient can be a thousand, two thousand dollars a day. Um, and like we just talked about, insurance has limited coverage. So the way I think about it is unless you have a lot of money or you have platinum insurance, the odds of you having the ability to get the amount of care and the length of care that you really need to fully recover from an eating disorder makes it, it's a very, very small number of people. At the end of the day, if an eating disorder takes, you know, two years to recover from start to finish, truly do the thing, um, and you have all the support you need all the way, and that's not a set number, it's just sort of like kind of a minimum number on average, right? That's a quarter of a million dollars unless you have platinum level insurance and you know most people don't have that lying around. There's also a lack of confidence in healthcare providers who um, you know the medical industry is really has some implicit fat phobia and prescribes diets to people who have eating disorders rather than screening them for eating disorders so there's a ruptured trust and a harm that can occur with primary care physicians. Um, or even with eating disorder providers who haven't done up-to-date trainings or who are still perpetuating some um, unhelpful, outdated evidence-based types of care or trying to apply evidence-based care for a young anorexic female to you know, a 45-year-old Black woman with binge eating disorder. You know, they don't require the same treatment. And when you try to, to do that, you can definitely create a lot of harm. There's a lack of diversity in mental health um, and medical providers. That image I showed you at the beginning is just one example of that. But when you have a, a multiple layers of marginalization in your identity and all of your doctors look the same or they match that dominant identity, it can create a lot of distrust for sure. And then there's just implicit bias across uh, the eating disorder landscape and the medical community. and that doesn't even account for the shame that people with eating disorders have. And that's the most common thing that you'll hear from people who actually have eating disorders is that they don't wanna tell anyone, they're embarrassed, they wanna hide it. It's uh, very, very painful to disclose and people will go to great lengths not to talk about it. And so imagine having all of these external barriers telling you you don't qualify for treatment, you're not sick enough, you know, this isn't for you, this is unlikely to be about you, you know, you're, you're not represented here. But, and then internally, you're also saying, you know, I'm surely I'm not sick enough, or surely this doesn't apply to me, or I, this can't be that big of a problem, or I could never tell anyone about this, um, or even just not knowing, right? If you only see one kind of eating disorder talked about broadly, you may never even ask if you have an eating disorder of yourself, because it doesn't occur to you. It doesn't occur to you about other people. It doesn't occur to you about yourself. And that leads to people not telling their doctor like, hi, I have been throwing up five times a week. That can go under the radar for years and years um, until suddenly there are medical consequences and that, that shame and that stigma is very problematic. Yes, thank you so much for that overview of the barriers. And I just want to address a question from the audience. So Andrew, um, great question. Is there any information about how formulas and biometrics around height, weight, and body composition mislabel people as obese when they're not? 
And absolutely, I think, um, you know, we see that a lot, you know, a heavy reliance on the BMI and BMI, I always tell people we have to be careful with that because, um, you know, there are some individuals, especially different um, that may have different muscle composition um, to body fat and BMI is just very, it's super generic doesn't account for um, muscle, it doesn't account for, you know, all those sorts of things. And it also doesn't mean whether or not somebody is sick or not. And I think that was um, oftentimes an argument I would have to make with the insurance companies whenever my patients would get denied, because they would say, oh, well, the BMI is normal, so they're fine, they could go home. And it's like, um, no, but excuse me, they are struggling, they're engaging and binging, they're engaging in purging behaviors. Again, it's impairing their ability to participate in work, to go to school in their everyday relationships. So, you know, we have to look more at more, we have to turn away from the BMI, I think, and if we do look at that, we have to really make sure we're looking at trends in BMI for that individual, rather than comparing them to whatever the median is for our society and for the U.S., which is generally when you even look at the studies looking at BMI for average population, they're not even accounting for people of color, right, when you look at those studies. So we're comparing them to a group of individuals and that aren't necessarily, they're not represented in that data. Um, so I think that could be very dangerous. If we look at BMI, we want to look at that person's individual growth and weight over time. And if we see changes for that individual, then that's when, you know, we want to do something about it. So really great question. Um, in terms of uh, continuing this whole thread of um, barriers to, to treatment, we talked a little bit about implicit bias, right? And um, when there are some studies looking at um, different medical providers in the community who were presented with identical cases of eating disorder symptoms in white, Hispanic, and Black women. And they found that clinicians were um, less likely to identify problematic eating disorder behavior in Black women. So these numbers, so 44% identified that the white women's eating behaviors were problematic, 41, which these numbers still aren't good, by the way, 44 and 41% still, that's not great. So we have work to do generally, but look at that difference between 44% and 17% identifying when a black woman's eating disorder was problematic. That is because of implicit bias, okay? We're coming in, we're making assumptions maybe we're not even asking our patients, right? What's your relationship like with your body? What kind of behaviors are you engaging in? You know, there's a lot of research that shows that black individuals and Latino, um, Latin, Latinx individuals are far less likely to go to their providers with the chief complaint of eating disorder behaviors. Also, they're less likely to go to a mental health provider altogether much more likely to go to a primary care provider if they're having any kind of featured physical symptoms, which again, physical symptoms can happen if you're at low weight or normal weight or overweight. That's a whole nother conversation, but um, physical problems can happen. It doesn't matter what weight you are, they manifest themselves in various ways. And what we've found is that these individuals are much more likely to go to a primary care doctor, or if they do go to a mental health provider, generally speaking, their eating disorder is not going to be their chief complaint. I would say that is, I see that in my own practice. Um, it's very rare that people come to me um, who are people of color for a chief complaint of the eating disorder. They may come for depression, they may come for anxiety. And it's really not until I ask but then they reveal, oh, well, actually, hmm, I thought that might be a binge behavior, but I didn't really know. And, you know, so I'm finding myself educating as I'm even doing my intake when I'm asking them questions about their eating behaviors and if they're exhibiting any compensatory behaviors. So all of that to say, I think we just have to do a better job as clinicians in terms of recognizing when eating disorders exist, asking about disordered behaviors and making sure that's just a part of our general intake information. We're not only asking certain populations based on what we've seen in the past and allowing our own bias to um, determine that, but really being systematic and asking and evaluating for eating disorders in every single patient that we confront. Mm -hmm.
I think about this sometimes when I'm at a doctor's office and you know, you're asked about smoking and you're asked about number of alcoholic beverages and you're asked about drugs and maybe you're asked about exercise, but given how common eating disorders are and how deadly they are, you'd think that it'd be pretty simple to ask, do you go for long periods of time without eating? Do you ever throw up after meals? It's it's not even a, a complicated question. It's a really important screener and it's not covered in medical residencies. Sorry, I live in New York. If you heard the, <laughs> it's just part of my- I just, I just wanna highlight Rebecca, I forgot. I didn't see the second part of his question. And he said, um, does that cause or lead to body dysmorphia? Absolutely. I can't tell you how many kids kids that I see who in their health class, their teachers give them, you know, overview of BMI and then they're given a number and then they're like, oh my gosh, I'm obese. And it's like, no, you are in puberty and you <laughs> are growing and this is normal for your body, but they may engage in eating disordered behaviors and actually see cells that could absolutely contribute to body dysmorphia. And I see it happen all the time. So just wanted to make sure I answered that. <laughs> Thanks, Erica. And thanks for your question. Um, so I think it's important to know, we're squeezing so much into such a short period of time, but I think it's important to kind of uh, think through, you know, why at an eating disorder treatment center is it a mostly homogenous patient population? Um, and one of those has to do with diagnostic criteria, um, you know, especially the DSM-4, previously the DSM-5 had a specific BMI requirement for anorexia. It also had a menstruation requirement for anorexia, which automatically excluded people outside of a cis female gender identity from being diagnosed. Um, and, and even now there's sort of atypical anorexia where a person meets all criteria, but isn't technically underweight and therefore is considered atypical. And yet they may experience the same organ failure and every single other consequence of anorexia and is at risk for dying of anorexia, despite not visually looking a, a certain way. And so thinking about it that way, um, there's a lot of other ways in which the diagnostic criteria is, is not necessarily um, culturally or diversity informed. Effective treatments have primarily been researched on young anorexic subjects. Um, and so when we talk about evidence-based care, the evidence that we're talking about is primarily about treating young um, anorexic and bulimic female subjects. And then insurance companies require that treatment centers and providers are providing evidence-based care. They don't wanna pay for like woo-woo, spiritual healing or equine therapy. You know, Insurance companies don't wanna spend money on things that you know, aren't proven to work. And so when we talk about what's proven to work and we only have research in a specific subsection of the population, then we don't have effective treatments for people of all different kinds of diagnoses and, and life experiences. Like I mentioned, treatment is very expensive. Um, providers, for the most part, match their identities. If you're a thin, young, affluent white woman going to treatment, like almost definitely you're gonna have a majority of your providers who have a similar shared experience to you, and that is a privilege. Um, it just cuts through a ton of explanation and you know misunderstandings and things like that. And it helps you get closer to the heart of the issue a lot faster. Um, and that's, a, that's something that everyone with an eating disorder deserves. Um, meals provided lack cultural inclusion. Uh, they're, prime, they're like very mainstream Americana foods, not a lot of um, modifications available for different, um, for, you know, halal or for uh, kosher or, you know, other kinds of, of typical like foods that are associated with specific cultures. And then we get into sort of the size and weight bias of treatment centers where furniture and medical equipment are designed for lower weight people. Um, and there's also an individualist approach to a lot of treatment modalities that really just focus on the individual person healing regardless of their context. And even the higher levels of care are fully removing people from their family and their cultural context and then expecting them to be able to carry on without any family or, or um, adjustment or incorporation work of like, how do you recover from your eating disorder within your existing actual context? Um, and so that really misses the mark on people who come from the more collective and community-based cultures. 
So conclusions before we open it up for questions. Um, I hope it's clear that representation matters. If you are some, someone who is struggling with food or with body, being able to look online or at a treatment center or at you know, in organizations, um, staff and board and being able to see yourself reflected there, it, it immediately lowers your internal barriers, it reduces your shame and it makes you feel safer. Um, that's something that Project Will has been working on and still has a lot of work to do with. And I know a lot of treatment centers are focused on that as well. And we have a long ways to go, um, but it really, really matters. Um, and awareness matters not only among people who have these disorders, but families and teachers and medical providers who are the people who can do the early intervention and diagnosis. Um, and treatment access matters. So, you know, the fatality rates of eating disorders are absolutely informed by the low rates of treatment um, and are impacted by the barriers to treatment access. And so I think one of the main reasons we see such a singular image and here is such a narrow story, going back to the beginning of this, right? Who has an eating disorder? What does someone with an eating disorder look like? I think one of the reasons uh, that that is, is because that's the person who's most likely to be diagnosed. It's also just because of systemic racism and, and the structure of the United States in general, they are more likely to be able to afford treatment. Um, they're more likely to benefit from treatment because it was designed for them based on research that was done on people like them. Um, and therefore they're more likely to recover. And um, not everyone, of course, is this true for, um, but it's it's a more likely scenario. Um, and then after they recover, they're more likely to tell their story and they're more likely to become a recovery advocate. And then they're also more likely to become an eating disorder provider. A lot of amazing eating disorder clinicians are themselves recovered. And so when we circle back to the beginning of this and we think about the impact of what our bias or our stereotypes are of who has an eating disorder, it has this huge ripple effect um, and it, it, it damages, you know, generations of people. Um, and so even now it's like, we want to diversify our staff or we want to diversify our treatment providers. There aren't enough uh, people of color. There are not enough people of different sizes and different ages and different um, ethnicities that can be hired because they haven't even been identified as being part of this community. Uh, they haven't seen themselves reflected. They don't have treatment that works for them and they're, they're not as commonly existing in the recovery conversation. And that's a huge problem and that cycles and repeats itself, right? And so I think that treatment access is in many ways a solution to this um, awareness and getting people into treatment so that we can have more people of all body sizes, shapes, races, genders, et cetera, who are in treatment, getting care, who are participating in research, and who then get to tell their story. And then we can learn more about actually what that experience was like and see them more commonly reflected in the recovery community. So I mentioned earlier why this matters, how many people have eating disorders, how many people are not getting care and the impact of that. And I'll pass it to you, Erica. So you may be asking, okay, so you gave us all this information <laughs> can I do? What can we do about this? I think number one, we really want to make sure that if you are a clinician, that you're asking, that you're evaluating all of your patients, um, making sure that you're making your treatment modalities relevant, you know, accounting for cultural differences. For instance, if there's an individual where they need family-based treatment and that grandmother is a big part of the family who's providing the intervention, then we want to include grandma in treatment, right? You know, if there are some other things, maybe they want the pastor involved, which I've done several times, um, because again, there can sometimes be misunderstandings if somebody is required to fast for and we're saying, okay, we actually that might not be healthy and let's actually bring someone in from your church so we could talk about maybe other ways that you can honor your faith that may not be detrimental to your physical and mental health, right? So how do we account for those cultural differences? How can we adapt our treatments to make sure that we're um, sensitive to those cultural differences? 
The other thing we can do, we can all pick up a phone, we can all write an email, we can all send a letter to those in, um, who represent us, right? Because there are let, um, lawmakers who are making decisions about healthcare and parity oftentimes they really don't understand the decisions that they're making. And it's up to us as professionals to inform them that, hey, we need to make sure that there is parity when it comes to treatment of eating disorders. You know, that for a long time that didn't exist. And fortunately with the 21st Century Cures Act, which was passed back, I think in 2017, there was some language around making sure that we're um, looking at eating disorders in the same way that we're looking at other psychiatric conditions and medical conditions. Oftentimes eating disorders are kind of left in that middle bucket where people say, oh, well, that's medical. You know, they have to meet medical criteria in order to be on inpatient. And then the psych, you know, you get the opposite, right? From the psychiatric standpoint. So it really is understanding that these are both medical and psychiatric conditions that are deserving of equitable healthcare access and treatment. And we have to make sure that we are doing our job to advocate for that. So calling on your senators and your representatives when there are, um, you know, when there's legislation online to better advocate for your patients. The other thing is we want to support research that investigates effective treatment of all kinds of eating disorder that can impact all different kinds of populations. What we know that the research in the past is starting to change, it's starting to shift some, but the research in the past really was focused on only one type of eating disorder, anorexia nervosa, and in a lot of individuals who were able to afford treatment. So it left out folks from different socioeconomic backgrounds, it left out folks with other types of eating disorders. So we really wanna approach research in a different way. And also that means, you know, acknowledging that, you know, there are people who we may need to be intentional about recruiting to research trials. It's not going to happen passively, right? And again, that goes back to what Rebecca talked about in her last slide. Sometimes there's a mistrust of the medical community. Well, there's a reason for that, right? We look at the Tuskegee trial. We look at what happened with Henrietta Lacks and the HeLa cells. You know, there are a lot of um, unethical research studies that were done. And I wish I could say back in the 19, 10s and 1920s, but we're talking to the 1960s and 70s. So these people are still living and aware of some of the horrible unethical research studies that were done on black individuals that may cause them to really mistrust research. So we really have to approach it by being intentional with recruitment, but also seeing how can this research benefit Right. And I think that's often something that gets missed with research. We're so focused on, you know, getting the answer, but we want to make sure that we are trying to find ways to identify eating disorders and to treat um, eating disorders in different um, populations. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing, we want to just examine our own explicit and implicit biases. And I think we talked about that a lot already. Rebecca talked about her implicit biases. I surely had mine and it was great to be able to check myself and to humble myself to say, okay, I have a lot of learning to do. And I'm so glad that um, we're here together learning so we can just check those biases and make sure we're not overlooking individuals, even though it may not be intentional. Um, we also want to dismantle our own internalized beauty ideals, you know, those westernized, uh, westernized um, ideals of thinness and beauty, standards of beauty, and the whole thing that we're seeing in our culture of fat phobia, right? And it's January, so you and I are not immune to all of the commercials, all of the ads that we're seeing to lose weight, to go on this diet and diet, to monitor everything. So just checking that as well. And then lastly, what can you do? You can support organizations like MIT. MHAM, which is doing a great job. Thank you for hosting us. So supporting organizations like this, Project Heal, which Rebecca is going to tell you a little bit more about, that really are doing some great groundbreaking work on just making sure that there's equitable access to care for all individuals, no matter what ethnicity they are, no matter what genders they represent, no matter what their body types are. So um, that is, there, there are organizations out there that we can all support and get behind. 
Thank you, Erica. And I know that we're at time and I do want to leave some time for questions. So I'll just leave what Project Hill does up on the screen while we answer questions. Um, generally, we focus on these three types of barriers and we have a, a number of different programs that address them. We're very proud to do this work. Um, so I'll open it up to questions. If we want to go five minutes over, I'm happy to do that. Okay, thank you so much. I'm actually going to launch the final poll uh, because we people are starting to log off. So as people um, are submitting questions, I'm going to go ahead and have them uh, do the whoever's left do the uh, the poll. So there was another question that came in. I don't know if you could see it. Um, it was, is there a resource with examples of questions surrounding body dysmorphism that we could use to add these questions to our intake paperwork? Ooh, yeah, I think that's a great, um, I could definitely look into some resources, but what I definitely like to do, I, I like to keep my questions very open-ended with my patients. I always ask, what's your relationship like with your body? Mm -hmm. Did you learn growing up in terms of what body um, image is supposed to be? You know, what, what were some of the messages you learned in your family about body type and what's acceptable versus not acceptable? What's your relationship like with food? What's your relationship like with exercise? Um, I find that asking that in an open-ended way can give a lot of room for them to talk about their own cultural norms um, within, whether that's within their whole culture or in their individual family of what's acceptable, what's not, what's not acceptable. And you find yourself getting a lot of rich information when you're asking in that way. Another question I often ask during assessments is, um, tell me about a typical day of eating for you. And sometimes people will report something that you're like, whoa, red flag, right? Like that's way too little, or, you know, that's disproportionately high, or it's, the timing of it is, you know, unusual or worth investigating, and they may not have language for I restrict in the morning or I binge at night or whatever the case may be. So just literally saying like, what did you eat yesterday? And you can get a lot of really helpful information that way. And then I like to ask too, that's great. I asked that same question. And I also like to add, you know, do you ever participate in any kind of fad diets or, you know, weight loss solutions or anything like that, or the opposite, you know, I, I specifically do ask about binging, purging, um, mm -hmm. compulsive exercise. So I like to get into the specifics, but I also want to know what their relationship is like too. Someone is asking about um, the additional readings and resources that we mentioned at the start of the presentation. So anybody who didn't hear the response at the beginning, um, I will be sending out uh, after we're done the PowerPoint presentation as well as a reading list uh, that Rebecca put together. So um, you should be getting that by the end of the afternoon. Um, there's another question. I'm a CASA, uh, court, I think it's a court appointed special advocate volunteer and wonder what questions to ask abused children, mainly teens, to recognize possible eating disorders? Yeah, that's a great question. And whew, that is intense, right? So thank you for volunteering. Um, that could be really tough working with children who are abused and have experienced trauma. We didn't get into trauma in this talk. That is, That could be a whole nother hour. I could go on. <laughs> about that. But actually, there is a high correlation, believe it or not, between trauma and eating disorders. And I do think it's very important to ask about that. I've, I know I've encountered that quite often in the children and adolescents that I work with. And I think with adolescents, I approach them in the same way, in terms of eating disorders, the same way I do with substance use. I, I just ask everyone. The thing about teenagers, if you don't ask them, they won't tell you, <laughs> but they generally don't volunteer the information. So you do have to be, I think, a little bit more explicit in your questioning with teenagers. Have you, you know, again, tell me about body image. You know, what does that look like for you? Do you engage in body checking behaviors? Do you restrict? And here are examples of restriction. You know, tell me again, 
day in a life, you're eating right habits. Tell me what a day looks like, any binging or purging. So you want to ask those specific questions. The other thing to note about PTSD or any kind of trauma, it doesn't necessarily be PTSD, but any kind of trauma response is that you can also see some of the other eating disorders that I didn't talk about. So pica and rumination disorders that can be commonly seen in individuals with trauma. So definitely asking about that too. Are there times when you eat foods that are non-food substances? Um, or are there times when you kind of ruminate and chew on your food over and over again? Or asking if they have any rituals that they do with food that can be that can come up as well. ARFID um, can also be, a, which is the avoidant restrictive food intake disorder, can also be associated with traumatic um, experiences. So, you know, asking those questions specifically, just like you would substances, you wouldn't just say, hey, do you do any substances? It's like, no, nope. you want to ask, okay. How often are you vaping? How often are you smoking? You know, how often are you having sex? You know, we want to be very direct with our teenagers. Mm -hmm. That's great. Thank you so much. Um, there is a question about um, references for the resources that you've talked about today. Um, I was going to give the link for Project HEAL and on your webpage, are there some resources or statistics that you have um, on the webpage or are there other resources that we should be communicating to people? Oh, that's a good question. I mean, there are, I know Erica has a number of the references for some of the research around um, racial disparities and eating disorders in this. In terms of, there's a few of the statistics uh, that I mentioned, like the 30 million Americans and the 20% of folks getting treatment and the frequency, unfortunately, of people who die as a result of their eating disorder. Those are such common statistics, and I talk about them all the time that I actually don't have the original resource, but I can definitely find them um, and send them to you after this. And the National Eating Disorders um, Association, that has a lot of really great, they have some awesome statistics, yeah. very detailed statistics in terms of, they break it down by the disorder, so you could see for binge eating, for ARFID. Um, if you wanna understand more statistics about athletes or specific um, you know, demographics, you can look at um, their website, which is nationaleatingdisorders.org. And they have a lot of different stats um, that we include from this call. I'll go ahead and add that web address to the, the reading list so that um, people have that as well. Great. Yeah. So, Erica and Rebecca, thank you so much for joining us today. It was a really informative webinar, and I like that they're, that you, what you're giving is some very concrete um, recommendations so that all of us can start asking better questions or culturally appropriate questions, you know, and, and checking our implicit bias is so important for all of us. So thank you so much for your time today, and we really appreciate your being with us. Thank you so much for having us. Thanks everyone for coming. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, I think people will just gradually log off. So, uh, you know, I, I do the advocacy piece just really stands out to me uh, in terms of educating the eating disorder community. I, I people are, I do you mind having two minutes while people are logging off? Can I ask you this? What kind of reception do you get from the eating disorder community when you talk about what you're talking about? Is there defensiveness? Is there receptivity? I, I honestly have received a lot of positive feedback about it. I think, um, you know, I, I did, we didn't have as much time today. I was telling Rebecca when we were preparing for this, I was like, I could talk about this for hours and I have, <laughs> um, because I also, do connect it to my own personal experiences, which I think sometimes can resonate with other clinicians. You know, just being in this space, I was telling Rebecca earlier, when I first got into this whole eating disorder world, um, you know, I got into it because I was really passionate about it. And because I, again, I checked my own biases. I'm like, oh my gosh, there are people suffering and we're not getting, we're not treating them, you know, and how, what, how can I contribute? Um, but to get into the field and to also see that there's nobody else who looks like me <laughs> field, it's very, you know, it's, it's very telling, um, and, you know, as a black woman, but also not seeing any men at all, you know, and I've treated black boys, teenagers, I've treated black girls, I've treated Latino girls and boy, you know, it's, you know, I've seen some and I've heard people tell me, you know, I've never, I've never treated an individual, a black person with an eating disorder. I'm like, then you're missing it. 
you're missing it because I can't tell you how, again, it's very unlikely that people come to me with that with a chief complaint, but I pick it up every single time. And I actually have quite a few individuals that have struggled for years. And that's one thing I didn't necessarily get a chance to highlight is that, you know, because we missed the diagnosis early on, we tend to experience um, just more severe illness. Um, and that's true of pretty much every medical condition. Um, there's so many health disparities that exist. That's that's common for asthma or heart disease or any you know breast cancer or whatever. Um, but we tend to catch it far later. And again, early intervention is key. So if we're not asking those questions and we're not picking it up. People suffer and they're going to suffer silently. And the shame and the stigma of I just, I can't have an eating disorder because that's a white girl disease. I'm black, you know, and I've had parents tell me that. My doesn't have anorexia. That's a white girl disease. I'm like, well, she had anorexia. <laughs> so we have to work together to figure this out, you know? So it, we have to, I think, just talk. The more we talk about it, that's why I'm so grateful for this platform because the more we talk about it and get the word out, then people will check it and then they'll be able to implement it into their own practice. And that's mm -hmm. really passionate about. I just want to add that in terms of my particular conversations I have in the field, the, the pushback that I get is that sometimes when I, I'm, I'm sort of trying to challenge this stereotype and this myth, people might interpret that I'm saying that thin, rich, white girls with anorexia don't matter somehow, and that is not true, right? Uh, right. They are significantly more likely to have a a medically related death related to their eating disorder. And so, and they deserve recovery, they deserve treatment. There's a reason that people have researched it uh, because it's really scary and it's really important. Um, and so it's not at all to exclude the stereotype. They are sick too. Uh, it's, just, it's just that there's a, a, a way, way bigger pool of people who are being ignored. And that's, that's who I'm spending my time focusing on because they're not at the table. It doesn't mean that they're, that the stereotypes aren't, you know, valid and like that their lives are not so precious. Um, and, you know, we, we love and care about everyone <laughs> with an eating disorder. Yeah, the, the statement about um, access is huge, right? So, you know, the advocacy piece around what the Medicaid is paying for, um, what people are expected to just come up with out of pocket, it's, there's some really important issues that you're taking on. So I, I really personally appreciate the two of you and we have nine people who've stayed for this extra conversation. So I, I will log off, but um, thank you so much to the two of you. I really appreciate your time um, and spending this afternoon with us. Thank you. Take care. Bye everyone. Bye.